This is the OGM Weekly Call for Thursday, December 7th, 2023. Uh, at the end of last week's check-in call, we had a really nice idea show up, which was uh, basically how to talk about honoring all things or resacralization or other things like that and how, what role that plays in everything else we've been talking about. And I would love to um, kind of dive in wherever anybody is is uh, moved to take us in that topic. I, I got a nice note from Gil, who is having cataract surgery this morning and won't be able to um, to join us. So um, we'll be down him. But uh, I'm eager to see what what um, what this topic actually sort of even means to all of us. So whoever would like to step in, please do. I'll, I'll step in. I'm, I'm really disappointed in humans um, in the way that they interact with great pretty much start. everything. That's but, a great start. Thank you. <laughs> um, but especially animals and especially um, animals uh, in our meat market systems and you know wildlife harvesting systems and stuff like that it is just shameful and it makes me embarrassed is not a strong enough word to be human when i see what other humans do to other species and and different than most people maybe i don't know a lot of people go well it's a shame what those people did to those other people and it's like yeah okay but at least they're they're both humans, you know? I mean, humans are really terrible to other humans, but- All the time. Whatever. But to go outside of your species and just like, you know, subjugate and torture and mutilate and kill, and it's like, pff, just ridiculous. So uh, I, I've got friends who who will pick up a rock and say, look, this rock is, you know, listen to this rock and it's saying things and, you know, do you want to take it away from its place? You know, listen to the rock before you take it someplace. Maybe you don't want to bring it home. Maybe it wants to sit right there. And I kind of get that too, especially in the presence of somebody who has, who can feel the energy of rocks, which I've been with those folks. Um, but at least I think the rock is a little bit, you know, a little bit, it has a longer, you know, longer timeline and stuff like that. But, you know, uh, like looking at a cow or an octopus or a chicken or a dog or, you know, it's like, oh my God, please, people, what the heck are you doing? And, you know, the thing that the other thing is, I have this feeling that it's, it's one thing that you're, you're injuring the whatever the word for humanity is for people who aren't human but it's one thing that you're injuring their agency and their you know well-being and their you know their their right to existence and things like that the other thing is when you're doing something when you're subjugating somebody else you're reducing yourself you are the one who is taking agency in that situation and and you know it's like okay i want to be instead of being a good human or a good dog or a good cow or a good frog, I want to be less than that. I want to torture that animal and be less, less good than that even, you know? So not even like, you know, like it's, it's one thing to harm something, but then to harm something, you're putting it, you're putting yourself at a lower level than it. It's like just insane to me that we do that. And yet we do that wholesale and have been for a really long time all around the planet. <clears throat> and it's it's the very tiny minorities like Jain people and others who take to heart what you just said and do the opposite. And a bunch of people who abstain from eating animals as a bigger group, uh, but still not that larger group. But thanks, Pete. Um, Klaus. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on Pete's theme. I mean, the, the violence that is so visible on animals that are uh, you know, uh, identifiable to us, you know, big enough so we can see them and, and you know, more feel them, 
that's one thing. But think about life inside the soil. You know, there are more microorganisms inside the soil in the spoon of soil than there are people on the planet. And we are killing them. I mean, with the way we treat the soil, which is a, you know, a living thing, uh, by dousing it with chemicals and you know, plowing it up and so on, it's just uh, it's just unconscionable. It's just it's just di more difficult. Now, the indigenous people. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm now thinking about you know, South America and you know, so indigenous people. They do have an intuitive understanding of of that life. A tree is life. You know, plants are living, and so the this violence that we and. and it's not even, I mean, it's violence on one level, but on the other level, it's just neglect. It's just being being divorced, right? Being uh, unconscious of what we're doing there. Uh, so it really is nature itself. It's not just the, the, the species, the, uh, species of animals that we can identify with. It's really all of life, you know, where we are completely reckless uh, and, and, and just unaware, you know, in 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 ways that that are now really uh, starting to hurt us. Totally agree, uh, Judy. Well, part of the reason that I raised this topic was that for many years now, my form of meditation has been to sort of connect with what I call everything, which is the earth, the animals, the creatures, the trees, the stars. Um, it's just, it is truly everything in kind of caps. Um, and there's a very stable energy to that when you connect with that from a meditative standpoint that is, allows one to sort of appreciate all of those dimensions that are affecting our existence. We're just one of many that are in that much, much larger ecosystem. And I think it's, it's a healthy perspective, and I wish there were a way to enable others to feel that connection because it alters how you feel about everything you do. Thanks, Judy. Um, I love that. Uh, John? Oh, oh, let me get... Yeah, I'm open. Okay, great. Yep. Uh, wow. Uh, <laughs> I got about five reactions. I, I'm going to... You know, edit the list because of time. One is the first one is just kind of a, a footnotey thing to, I mean, come back or to think about, although I'm happy to discuss it in greater detail if somebody wants to. I had this reaction. I think many people know who Temple Grandin is. Um, she's an autistic uh, professor of animal science. <laughs> and she's just amazing. I mean, you know, the first thing you got to say is, wow, you know, here's this person who had a significant, uh, what we would normally classify as a significant disability and uh, had, did a wonderful, you know, outreach. I mean, it really extended herself into areas of knowledge and expression that are clearly quite difficult. Uh, you could also take the view that, I mean, some people would take the view that, gee, she's a humane, she's a humane uh, mediator or humane supporter of meat eaters because she wants to make the process of processing cattle humane. And she looks at it from the cattle's point of view. And I mean there's so many places we could go with that. Uh you know, you could you could say, yeah, that's okay, you know, or you could say, no, no, no. I mean and I don't kind of really want to go there. I just kind of want to reference that um uh, I found reading her both enlightening and disturbing at the same time and it just it just made me think a lot with a lot more complexity and detail about this set of issues uh i re i really appreciate pete for for raising this point he's he points multiple points uh pete your views are, are a bit more extreme than mine but i really appreciate them because they're they're a good stretch um there is this idea that uh well the idea of diminishment is sort of a subset of the idea of uh who are we and what are we doing here and um so you can you could be quote unquote pro animals or pro species that's one way to look at it 
it's interesting to take this other view that says, hey, no, 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 we're not asking you to uh, be nice to animals, you know, because they're enough like us that the, 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 the ethical complications are disturbing. No, no, no. So we're asking you or we're inviting you to expand your notion of war in a way if you can look at this way. John, we lost your okay, last... Okay, so I'm, there's other know, places I could go. We lost your last sentence um, because... We lost uh, the last... The signal, just the last uh, sentence. We've been following you pretty well so far. Okay. Uh, I, I, if I can recall, it was not asking you to uh, like animals because they're like us. We're asking you to expand your idea of who, what it means to be human. So it's actually an enrichment of humanity, not a trying to up level animals to our level. Does, does that make sense? Anyway, that's you know, totally. there's a lot more here, a lot more material, but. I'll stop. That's good. That's good. Good place to stop. That's great. Thanks, John. And thanks for giving us a, a, a view of downtown San Francisco, I think. San Francisco, Oakland, where are you right now? Uh, I'm in San Francisco now. I'm walking to the grocery store. Sweet. Thanks, John. Uh, Pete, then Stacy. Um, thanks. And thanks, John. Um, the 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 touchstone for me is um uh compassion uh compassion means together and feeling um thinking you know putting yourself in the in the other being's place and and thinking about what's happening to them so i i actually really appreciate temple grand and um as i said in the chat i i'm not anti eating animals i'm anti torturing animals <laughs> you know um uh so so by the way i i have a personal story i've never i've never really said this to anybody except my wife joanne um uh my my one of my kids in particular both of my kids were animal sensitive growing up i was animal sensitive growing up i think my wife would have been except her her parents and her family situation held her back from being with animals. So I grew up with a few dogs, not a bunch of them, but I was really close with them um, and really good at, at being attuned with them. Um, my daughter picked that up too. And so she went through a, a series of, of volunteering with animal shelters and animal rescues, cats and dogs and horses and, and the zoo and the wildlife museum growing up. Same as her older, older uh, sibling. Um, some of that time, uh, my wife and my daughter were walking dogs, uh, at, uh, at PHS, Peninsula Humane Society. Um, so I got a secondhand view of what it's like to run a, uh, run a humane, uh, shelter, um, what it's like to be a dog in a humane shelter. Um, we ended up with, we ended up with two of the rejects. Um, so uh and living with our two dogs that were rejects in the in the humane society uh taught me a lot um so where i'm getting to is uh kill or no kill shelter shelters there are a bunch of super well-meaning people who say oh it's a shame that we have so many dogs and that they put them down oh my god they're going to put down dogs um uh yeah dinky um the, the two dogs that we had, uh, both of them got into the shelter system, however they did. Um, uh, and then they spent a long time in there and they were terrified the whole time they were in the shelter, just absolutely terrified. Um, uh, one dog was a mom. She came in uh, pregnant and had puppies right away. And then they took the puppies away from her, which drove her insane and crazy. Um, and she got actually really violent with people uh, she was on the list to get put down because she was just unmanageable, unmanageable because they took her kids away. Um, she was such a sweetie that uh, some of the volunteers lobbied for her and they got her off the, you know, the, you know, this dog is, is, won't even be able to be put, uh, 
put out for adoption because she's just too violent. We, we, <laughs> this was our second dog, actually. We got our, our first one, Dinky, first, but then we got her to kind of try to modulate Dinky. Um, she was just a, the sweetest thing. We fostered her. We didn't want another dog, um, but we fostered her. She was a sweet and loving, uh, wonderful dog once you got uh, her, you know, out of the shelter situation. Um, I, I have a bunch of stories about the reason we ended up fostering her and then adopting her because the, the pound didn't want her back. Um, uh, literally, like the whole the whole time she was in in her little cage with a few other dogs, um, she was in the corner, just like cowering, like just scared to death, right? Um, her tail was all the way tucked in. Um, uh, Joanne and, and Gwenny would come in and, and pick her up and she would be so happy because she got a little bit of time outside for a walk, right? Um, um, uh, Dinky, our other dog, uh, very, very kind of smart and genial dog, very thoughtful. Um, uh, lovely to play with. Uh, he and I have, I've, I've learned a lot about dog language and actually being a little bit more assertive from being with Dinky. Um, it was a, a dog trainer who's a little bit, a um, little bit controversial. There's a dog trainer, Cesar Milan, who um, teaches people how to be better, better humans when, with their dogs. Um, there's a whole bunch of dog body language and behaviors and stuff like that that make no sense to people. And they're actually like counterintuitive to people. But once you kind of know the language and why a dog is doing a thing, they make a lot of sense, um, more sense than, than people do usually. So the problem with, um, uh, problem with Dinky is that uh, he was kind of, irredeemable um uh he was a dog that was in the system for more than a year um i think he should have been put down because he was just stuck in the system um and you know and and the the volunteers there uh talked about how he was a, a dog that kind of got along with people and over time he got you know less and less and so towards the end of that year year and a half or something like that he got adopted out to somebody who <laughs> couldn't manage him. So he came right back. Dinky is this super sensitive little animal and he picks up the smallest little cues and he, he tries to be, you know, um, uh, he tries to be really attentive to what you're trying to say and he'll, he'll follow that, right? Whatever it is kind of. Um, and so having that situation where he gets adopted out, you know, and, and finally can relax a little bit. He too was kind of, he was um, violent in his, in his cell um, rather than cowering, but it's the same thing. He was in fear, terror the whole time. So somebody couldn't take care of him and, and brought him back. And I can just imagine what it was like for him. You know, wow, I get, I get to learn to how to be with somebody. And then I get put back in jail again, right? And I have to protect myself and I have to be fearful. I, you know, I love him. He's turned into a wonderful dog. Um, he was in an, you can tell from his behaviors, uh, if you, if anybody raises their arm like this uh, and surprises him, he will bark at you. And what happened, I can tell from his behaviors, he grew up in a, in a abusive home where the, the man uh, hit the woman a lot. And I can tell that because of the way he acts with me and my wife, even now he's got programmed to, to be like that. Right. Um, he's, but still, he's a wonderful dog. I love him. He loves me. Um, except when he's barking at me because it's late at night and his conscious brain is switched off and his unconscious brain is still protecting his, his, uh, previous owner. Um, still in all, it would have been more kind in the arc of his life to, to put him down early, right? So we have a different problem, which is why we have too many dogs. That's a completely different problem. But for me, this is, it's a, it's a weird thing to say, hey, folks that, um, you know, if, if you're sponsoring a no-kill shelter because it's a no-kill shelter, think about what you're doing. You know, think about, um, okay, so if you've got a hundred dogs in a shelter and you're not killing them for a year, what does that mean? What, you know, would you want to be in that situation? Um, would you want to be in a situation where nobody can even explain to you from day to day why you're, you know, in terror, um, uh, you know, essentially tortured every day of your life? 
I, it drives me crazy that, that people will stand up for a cause like a no-kill shelter and then not follow through and say, okay, so that means that every dog in there needs to have, you know, natural behaviors, uh, people who love it, a, a pack who loves it at least, uh, all that kind of stuff. So more of my, you know, more, more thoughts. And it's hard. It's difficult. I get it. But humans do a terrible job. Thanks, Pete. Um, Stacy. Thank you, Pete. If it was anybody else talking, I would have gone off screen and not listened because I, it's so hard for me to hear that, um, which brings me to my, um, the initial comment was a really short one. Um, you know, so much about our evolution and where we're going, in my mind, has to do with becoming aware of things and mindfulness. I know, Dinky. <laughs> Um, and I was just going to mention it was it was so weird as I was like scrolling on Facebook, I saw people arguing, apparently some teacher somewhere, maybe it was Alaska, I didn't even bother to look at that part, but had brought in a dead animal and he was going to teach the kids how to quarter it or whatever. And the people were arguing you know, how disgusting it was or whether it was life skills. But I was just thinking to myself, what hypocrisy. They, they, they weren't arguing that you shouldn't eat the animal. They were just arguing that children shouldn't know or that you shouldn't see what you're doing. And I know that's a hypocrisy I have within myself. I would not be eating meat if I had to go and kill the animal. I know it wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't. Um, although I do, I mean, I would like to see different farm practices. I'm not, like Pete said, I'm not anti-meat eating. <coughs> I'm not anti-torture. Um, was there anything else I wanted to say? I got so thrown off because it's, it's hard. It's, it, you know, it's, um, I think it's harder because there's such a gentle nature. There's such an innocence there. It, it's almost more difficult for me to hear about. Yeah, I'm not even gonna go there. Um, I do think though, that we should see more of what's happening. You know, I've spoken to people that are like, you know, they're vegans and they've always been you know, their, their feeling is 20 years ago when they were working in this field, it didn't matter if people saw what was happening. People know what was happening. And my answer is, this isn't 20 years ago. I think it does make a difference if people were actually, if you actually had to see what was happening. I think people understand how people that work in those fields get desensitized and dehumanized. And I think that maybe there's more of a connection how those things bleed into the rest of society. And when I say those things, I mean anything that leads to desensitization. So I'm, I'm all over the place here, but I'll stop for now. But you're making a lovely point, Stacey. Um, we're getting a little bit of noise, Judy, I think from your mic, because your rectangle is lighting up for me, um, but it might not be. Um, thanks. Uh, Doug, please. Uh, Doug C. Yeah, uh, I'm convinced that every animal knows more about what's important to them than we know about those things. Uh, that's pretty powerful. But stronger uh, is that I believe that every animal, including insects, have a stronger desire to save their life as we do. Can you say a little more about that? Well, it's hard because we think that smaller animals have a smaller nervous system so that their pain about facing death must be diminished. But I no longer believe it. I believe it's actually as intense as our own. If we're threatened, uh, we have a deep visceral reaction and animals do too. 
and it's not proportional to their size. It's part of the equivalent, the, the possession of being an animal. Thanks. Um, Ken, you posted in the chat about Wetiko, uh, which is sort of a soul hunger and things like that. And it reminded me that a piece of our conversation around this before uh, was kind of about God and belief systems and the decline of religion and the rise of nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S. Uh, and I and I don't know whether you're um, uh, adding Wetiko to our conversation from that vector at all. I think there's lots of different ways in which it, it fits here. But, but one of the questions in my head is, um, how what what's the path toward filling that spiritual hunger because i think a lot of people are busy looking for belief systems to to close that loop and that that's a fail mostly and and so there's this massive set of wishes desires unfulfilled desires hungers uh et cetera et cetera and and um you've been walking the buddhist path for a really long time which i think does a reasonable job of filling those desires by focusing on them and almost setting them aside, making them explicitly a part of, of a belief system in some sense. But, um, and I'm just dancing around the issue here, but if you would, uh, if you would riff on that for a moment, I'd appreciate it. So um, the, the Buddhist path <clears throat> has this idea of the hungry ghost and our ghosts are depicted as these enormous beings with these huge, huge bellies and tiny, tiny mouths. And no matter what they do, they can never get enough. They're always grasping. They're always, you know, and people can be taken over by hungry ghosts. And you can't get rid of them. But what you can do is is set a boundary and say, I give you this much, and that's going to have to be enough. And then you go on and figure out how to, you know, live your life without devoting yourself to the feeding of your ghosts, which is a very interesting path because... My understanding, and I am not an expert on on Tico, but um, from an indigenous perspective, it's a um, it's very similar to Hungry Ghost. It, it's a mind virus, and I I'm very intrigued with his idea because I hear people say, you know, we we do a terrible job. You know, humans are awful, and it's like there's a group, a subset of humans that that are doing this. Not all humans, um, and I think it's important to make that distinction. Um, you know, so when you're taken over by Vitiko, you are no longer sense yourself in relationship with the rest of the world. It's there, it's a threat. You become consumed with fear and you try to control things, and that can lead to all the things that we're seeing going around today. Um I don't know that it's possible for eight billion people to live on this planet. Uh in the kind of way that I think most of us on this call would want to see. Um, you know, I despair, and despair is not even strong enough a word. I have huge despair for the fact that in my lifetime, in 66 years, 70% of mammals have disappeared off the face of the earth, 30% of insects, 5 billion birds, or 30 billion birds, depending upon who you're talking to. This is a tremendous loneliness that I think only people who live close to the land are aware of. And those are folks who are not in cities. People in cities have no idea that it's happened. And, um, you know, I don't know how to deal with that. Um, I don't know how to honor that. You know, I, I try to honor that my own way. Uh, we're talking about honoring things. How do we honor omnicide? You know, and how do we reverse omnicide? Which is the term that I got from Amitav Ghosh from the Nutmeg's Curse. How do we recognize the operation of a mind virus in ourselves? And we can go back, if you want, to the, the, the Neanderthals. It's a very good chance that Homo sapiens murdered and extincted the Neanderthals. You know, Homo sapiens as a species tends to be pretty bloodthirsty, but not all of us. And I think there's there's something that occurred in our evolutionary path along the way. Um you know, what uh, Matrano would say, we started to conserve some really bad behaviors. And how do we uh, recover 
behaviors that will allow us to live with the world as relations. You know, you do, if, if you see the entire world as alive, if you see the world as a set of relationships that you are intricately connected to, you behave in very different manners than if the world is inert and, and only useful when you're exploiting it. From Klaus's point about the soil to the way that we, you know, keep putting rockets up and and you know, just ripping holes in the in the atmosphere through that. I mean, we we live in a culture that is extremely out of balance. Um, and what's the way back? How do we restore that balance? How do we honor the fact that we are all of the earth you know you do not find humans anywhere else in the universe we came out of the earth the earth was here before us and we will go back to the earth and we are treating it as if alan wants to say the ceramic model that god you know made this earth and placed us here to do whatever we want and that doesn't work that leads to the kind of of um breakdowns that we're seeing everywhere around us so i don't know i'm i'm you know i'm i'm very much in the in the mystery and the question of you know what is right relationship what's what's the path that that supports and sustains all life and creates well-being um because i think if we're not paying attention to that then we then we go down the rabbit holes that lead to the kind of destruction that we're seeing all around us um thanks ken a lot uh, you're reminding me of another question that swirls in the back of my head all the time which is uh, I, i'll paraphrase it in the chat here must caring cultures always fall to warrior cultures because one of my beliefs about history is that there have been many civilizations that figured this shit out <clears throat> and that have lived well on the land and well with each other and sorted out how to figure out conflict and all that kind of stuff and the problem is it's a little bit guns germs and steel when somebody shows up over the hill who's got more powerful weapons than you and you haven't spent a whole bunch of your time developing weapons or defense because doing the rest of it was more interesting more fulfilling and pretty much occupied your time as well you're done and that saddens me tremendously. Um, and that has to do with the other people over the over the hill being able to assemble an army and make those weapons and all that, which implies civilization. So, so the word civilization for me is pretty pretty tainted in so many different ways. Uh, Klaus, then Carl, then Hank. You, you must know Gandhi's, when someone asked Gandhi what he thought about Western civilization, he said, I think it's a very good idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I I, uh, I joined a progressive church when I was in my early 30s when my wife got pregnant and I realized that I had no idea what it meant to be a dad other than I didn't want to be my dad. Um, and so uh, since my wife is a good farm girl <laughs> with very strong uh, ways of uh, expressing her opinions, so we ended up in a in a church, but it was it was one of the progressive evangelicals where the pastor uh, and and a group of pastors actually had two degrees: one in theology and one in psychology, and in particular evolutionary psychology. So I, I ended up uh, leading a Sunday school. We had about fifty families, and was it? big church with maybe 8,000 members or so. But the teaching um, was amazing, right? Because the, the, this pastor really brought history to life. You know, what, do pe what did people really mean when they were saying heaping ashes on your head? You know, what did this mean 3,000 years ago? Well, it was to burn off your bad thoughts and to apologize for maybe you have slandered someone, you know? So, so to put these things into context, but when I and we, we, I, we spent maybe 16 years there, and our kids grew up you know, in this environment. And you know, I went to men's study, Bible study, and Sunday school, and church, and all of that. And it really anchored me in a lot of ways um, to be together with a group of, of other men who were in the same stage of development, little children, and uh, professional, and so on. But we, we, in all the topics we picked up, we never once really talked about this issue of what is our relationship with life and nature. Um, so when I when we moved to Hong Kong, um, I lost I lost touch. And when I came back ten years later, I realized that um, my 
uh, uh, friends had sort of stayed in the same place where, where I left off 10 years ago and I wasn't there anymore. Um, so I haven't really been able to reintegrate myself here for for you know, a, a number of reasons. But the, the Pope Francis wrote uh, an encyclopedia about uh, the cry of of um, of Mother Earth, you know, and I forgot what it's called. It's and uh, um, oh, is it Dale? Now I need to look it up. I, I post it, but he wrote and uh, that actually made me cry when I was reading it. You know, because uh, in the opening statement, you now he's saying what we're doing is unconscionable, and Pope, Pope Francis uh, is this historical figure. Know, who who was all engaged with nature and the and the natural in mind blood out of sea that's it yes and when you read this when you just read the opening statement of it it is just it's just phenomenal you know in in uh, an appeal you know, a plea to pay attention to uh, to the world around us because the challenge the challenge really is i mean we can Acknowledge that uh, you know, we have lost our connections, and uh, you know, and what uh, Ken posted, uh, uh, what is it called again? Uh, Vertical. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that completely you know, summarizes it. It's very accurate. But the question is, how do we get out of this hole, and how do we communicate with with people who really need to speak in these symbolic languages? You know. Um, and the and Pope Francis got just uh, got a bunch of hate, you know, in response to his lot out of sea. Uh, I mean, the American Catholics and uh, I mean everyone just you know uh, refused to even to even acknowledge this. But just taking lot out of sea and inserting it you know, into the conversation with Christians, uh, in if if we ever were able to reach that open mind. There is the, the foundation is there. Uh, the, 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 the language is there. The idea is, is there. Um, it's just very difficult to open it up and, and find um, find uh, people, find you know, progressive uh, pastors and, and spiritual leaders to embrace this and, uh, and, and translate it and use it now. So I, I think it's, it's, um, it's astonishing, you know, how we have lost, you know, really the ability to to use this religious language uh, and and uh, and and um, make it common because this language, you know, penetrates um, into into um, minds that are more into logic, more into um into science you know it really permeates through the entire uh, sphere I, mean, I would call it uh, the colors of the spiral um so anyway thank you so much um carl then hank then judy and take your time stepping into the conversation please In thinking about these issues over the years, there's kind of two clusters of things. You've got um, the power of the word. I mean, if you translated what, what's been translated as dominion, if that meant stewardship, actually. So, I mean, we had this age of domination. I mean, a lot of it is... Uh, the desire to for to be able to predict to have a to have a stable life. I mean, it's like I know I can go get in my car and drive downtown and be in my office in um, about twenty minutes, and there's like a ninety nine point nine whatever percent chance I can do that um, and things. So there's that side of it. It's like. Um, so can we can we say we won that part? But nature is going to win. There, Mother Nature and Father Time are tag teaming right now. Um, so can't I say kind of the indigenous like the Koji people, which we've brought up a couple of times before, 
Um, so there's that. And then several things, I mean, they, the, the indigenous consider themselves like the elder brother and um, Western civilization, the weird um, civilization is the younger child. Um, then there's also the, the sense of time. So, I mean, we have the paradise of the Garden of Eden and the world's been going to hell ever since. Or you've got the the progressive thing that that the um, the future can be better. I mean, you know, some I've been getting a lot more into that in some of my research. You have Robert Rosen with his anticipatory science. I've been I found an article that's talking about the not yet that's emerging. So live, can you be? It's the opposite of the psychological projection. I mean, people are imposing their the pathologies from the past on the present can we be seeing can we be envisioning the um, a better future and be embodying and living into that future make in in the present um type of thing um yeah there's so those are the two big those are the two biggies and then well, the other thing too then is this messianic thing. It's like we are going to save you, or we'll kill you. It's your choice. <laughs> and then, uh, Such a simple choice. Yeah. So I guess I'll leave it at that for now. Well, Carl, thank you very much. That was very helpful. Hank, whenever you like. I made a special effort to be home at this time, this day, when I read what uh, the starting question was, because uh, the last couple of months I've been taking a, uh, a course in uh, humanism and religious uh, belief. Uh, what is the area between them? And that's on a Thursday afternoon in different cities. So it's not always possible to get back in time for this conversation. And I'm really happy to have heard, heard, to have heard the contributions so far. So I want to just tell two things. Uh, I could probably tell more, but maybe later. Uh, our starting question for today is how might we honor all things? Well, there's a... Uh, a spiritual and a political contribution I'd like to make. I'll begin with the political. Uh, since 2006, there's been a uh, political party for the animals in the Netherlands. And since 2006, they've always had at least one, sometimes two, sometimes three seats in parliament. And uh, it's not only a party for the welfare of animals, but also for all issues contributing to a healthy world we can live in, universal health care, uh, economic systems change, uh, uh, Europe and international solidarity and things like this. So at least in the Netherlands, it's possible to have a political agenda which attracts thousands of people and makes a statement against, uh, well, what we have here and in a lot of European countries as a, uh, a right-wing populist, uh, anti-human and anti-animal political centrist. The other thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, I'll mention his name and I'll put a web link uh, in the chat, there's a uh, professor of nature and landscape conservation, uh, ecology and natural philosophy, who studied comparative religions at the University of the Netherlands. His name is Matthijs Schouten. Uh, there are a number of interesting articles by him in English online and uh, YouTube films uh, he's made online. Uh, I can certainly recommend that. But in terms of how we can honor uh, all things, one suggestion he made at a meeting I was at was 
to take some time every day to pay attention to something that is not man-made. And whether that's a an animal or an insect or a stone or a tree, take a minute or two several times a day to pay attention to things that aren't made by man. And I have started doing that since I heard him say that uh, a couple of months ago. And I think it's helping me to understand ways to honor all things. So that's my contribution for now. Thank you so much. Um, Judy. And you may have stepped away. Paging Judy Benham, please approach a white courtesy telephone. Um, whenever you come back, I'll come back to you. Uh, Doug C. Uh, you're muted. Oh, and, and feel free to take your time. Uh, I did not raise my hand so far as I'm aware. Ah. <laughs> But since I'm here, the spirits uh, raised it for you. Please proceed. This conversation is really powerful. And uh, when I say that animals are smarter than we are about what uh, is important to them, I remember bringing home two kittens in a three story, three bedroom, two story house. And within five minutes, they knew every entrance and exit to every room in that house. It was just amazing to watch them put that map together. So I'll stop there. Love that. I'm reminded by what you just said about the wisdom of horses. And I'm not a horse person, but I have enormous and like growing respect for horses, which are like large antennae for emotions and sensations. And they are unbelievable. Um, there's a kind of therapy called family uh, family constellations, which is usually done with people, where you take one person who's the client of the session, they picture their family constellation, sort of who plays what role, etc. They write down the different names on little slips of paper, and then the rest of the group, and I might be making up parts of this, but this is just from memory, uh, different people who have offered to help pick up the roles and just without necessarily looking at the slip of paper, put them in their pocket. And then uh, whoever's running the, the meeting asks everybody to stand relative to the client, however they feel they should stand relative to the client in the room. And it turns out that that is really evocative because people end up going to places that are meaningful for the role of the parent or the child or the uncle or whatever, the abusive uncle, who knows. Uh, and it turns out that you can also do this with horses. Uh, and that's a thing. So um, fascinating I've, stuff. I've had uh, the pleasure of being in several constellations, both business constellations and family constellations, and even a country constellation for this, the country of Bulgaria when I was there a few years ago. Um, and I got to tell you, it's, I have no framework upon which to hang this that makes sense because there's stuff that happens that is really woo-woo. Um, I was asked to represent uh, a man who'd been a defrocked priest because he'd been having affairs with parishioners. And um, so he resigned and then he went to a different church and became a pastor and started to have affairs with parishioners. And I was representing him and his wife was was watching um, as was his wife's best friend. And I was asked a question and I made a very flip remark. And I immediately apologized. said, oh, that wasn't really appropriate. And his girl, his wife's girlfriend came over and said, not only was that exactly what he would have said, your face took on his, you looked exactly like him when you said it. Wow. And I was like, whoa, this is really strange, <laughs> you know? Um, I also was in a constellation where I had gone to lunch um, and had a really lovely conversation with this man at lunch. And then an hour later, we were in a constellation where he was he was the uncle of, of me. And we were just standing together, and I thought we were going to get into a fight. There was so much tension and energy. Because I said, this guy's going to hit me. I'm going to hit him, you know. And um, I, I was instructed because 
the, the dynamic was this uncle had been very cruel to this to the nephew. He said, you know, take this rock and give it to him and say, this is your burden. I refuse to to receive it. And I put it at his feet and I said, I, I, I refuse it. And the guy said, no, no, you really have to do this with intention. And I did, and I just burst into tears, and I cried for about thirty seconds, and I was fine. And so there's there's stuff in constellations that that I, if you've never done it, go. It, it's really amazing. Um, I haven't had my own done, but I, I've been in about six or seven of them now, and um, it, it's you get information may or not be may or may not be um, the truth, but it's really useful information. Uh, my friend who teaches constellations you know, says look it's just information do with it what you will um and there's all kinds of variations but it's it's pretty incredible stuff ken i really appreciate your your firsthand story there that, that was wonderful um one of my amateur theories of humans and nature is that babies see things that we then train them out of that they can see auras and all that and that people who have that capacity are the ones who let that sort of survive through socialization and that animals also see those kinds of things. They can sense a lot of this energy in us in different ways. Um, and that there are a lot of phenomena that we have rationalized away out of our lives that are in fact real things. So one of the things I loved about, um, uh, the Healing Wisdom of Africa by Maladoma Somme was that it was the first time I read something where I was like, ah, crap, here's here's a, a guy who was raised in Western civil, you know, Western educational system, Western traditions and so forth, and then had an experience where he saw through the gateway into some other place and that shamans who are legitimate are the guardians of those gateways and that there's another piece of life that many traditions in particular some indigenous many indigenous traditions honor and value and make a part of normal life that we have managed in western tradition sort of normal western including religious tradition and certainly in scientific traditions to say if you can't measure it it doesn't exist therefore it isn't a thing or or to demonize even if it wasn't measurable because it was not a scientific it was a religious tradition anyway uh, judy you had your hand up earlier and you are back i'm wondering if you'd like to jump in and then i've got stacy and bill after you and you're muted so you're going to have to unmute i actually put my hand back down because i'd forgotten to put it down before so but i've made some comments in the chat i'll let it go at that I, I would maybe introduce the topic of humility as an opportunity for healing. Love that. Thanks, Judy. Uh, Stacy, over to you. Maybe this will tie into humility. Um, I'm going to just say this like a story because I don't know that I have the words and I'm just, I don't know that I'm going to be able to make the point, but I'm going to try. Um, so my heart, all of your hearts, but my heart's a magnet. If I follow my heart consciously or unconsciously, it's still going to draw certain situations to me. It's still going to magnetize certain energies to me in the form of people or situations. And maybe it draws those things to me because I need healing. In those situations, I'm usually less conscious of that. And that's why maybe it doesn't feel good. And I'm like, why is this happening to me? And that's usually the why. But if I'm conscious and I'm following my heart and I'm using my mind with my heart, because, you know, in the past, I was always taught you're supposed to leave your mind behind. And I fought that tooth and nail. And I'm glad I fought a tooth and nail because it's meant to work with my heart. But if I follow my heart, what I find is that situations and people that are resonating at around the same level come into my sphere. And so if I could connect that to the question of, like when Ken was saying there's subgroups, that helps to find the subgroup that's creating the reality that I wanna be a part of. So in that way, it's starting with me and the people that, and again, we're not all the same because it's just an energy. Different things are gonna happen within that energy, but it's creating a neighborhood 
an energetic neighborhood. And I think that's where we start in the small energetic neighborhoods. And if I could just connect two obscure things to that, Jerry, when you were talking about the, uh, the weapons and the military and the force, the only thing that I have ever thought can compete with that is relationships. And so real true relationships, like I think that we're making here in small groups, that's what really counts. Not just that, oh, you know somebody or you know we're part of the same group. That doesn't mean anything. And I think so many people are learning lessons of betrayal, um, but that's, an that's another topic. Um, and there was one other thing. Oh, uh, when Carl, Carl mentioned um, predictability and this morning before I got on this call, I came across um, Irvin Laszlo was interviewing Eric Braden. And it was the first time I heard it said that the better you know yourself, the less fearful you are. 100% agree with that. But it was interesting. So it was interesting to hear Carl talk, to, talk about predictability because again, that goes to the more aware of ourselves we become. Because we're always asking how can we be less fearful because fear is behind all these bad decisions that seem to be made. And, this tendency to use force. So again, I'm rambling a little bit, but there's a lot of dots that need connecting and hopefully I threw a bunch out. That's, that's excellent, thank you. Um, Bill then Klaus. Yep. I just want to go back to something Jerry said about sort of how we're or have been in our lives trained to not pay attention to a lot of things that we actually, I believe, can pay attention to. So I know this sounds completely weird, but there are two things. So one experience I've had in my life, you know, we've talked about, oh, I had an intuition you know, about this, but I didn't pay any attention to it. And over and over, my wife and I are like this. Well, if I'd already paid attention to my intuition, you know. So the way I've characterized it to her is like, so your intuition is like this little tiny voice over in the corner whispering, I have bring something very, very important to tell you. Hello. This is really, really important. And you're like, what is that noise? Just like get rid of that. I don't really care about that. No, it's really <laughs> Anyway, you know, so I have that experience. But the other, th so we have tried to be a little more attentive to that, but it's still really easy to miss a piece of information that you're receiving just because you're not really aware of like, wait, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> and the other thing I will share with you all is if when I'm, I'm able to see people's auras, not all the time. And I, if I can calm down enough, I can actually, but very often I can. Uh, and it's like a completely different kind of experience. And, and I've also had this uh, experience and you all may have it, but you know, in various little, when I was working more and I was in all these little meetings and meetups and you'd go to a conference, you'd be here and there. And um, my first experience in many of these situations is an emotional one. I remember walking into a big conference kind of thing and all the hair on my neck went up and I'm like, okay, Bill, you got to pay attention here. <laughs> Bill and you know, was, oh, sorry, go sorry. ahead. It's just, you know, it's just like I had, to, I have these experiences and I can't pay attention to them. And sometimes I just don't. <laughs> because I'm actually, you know, have been in a culture which doesn't really practice paying attention to these things. In your experiences like that, um, do people have consistent, persistent auras, or do they fluctuate with instantaneous emotions and other sorts of things? How how does that kind of 
how does that work? Like, would it doesn't I work have, like that. Have... It doesn't work like doesn't work like that. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I don't have a thermometer. You know, it's like yeah. no, it's it's not that kind of an experience. It's just cool. Thank you, uh, Klaus and Judy. Yeah, I really relate to what Bill is saying here. Um, around the same time that Laudato Si came out, um, that was roughly the time when I had retired and started taking courses um, in Introduction to Sustainability. I took a course with Jeffrey Sachs uh, in their introduction to uh, at, at uh, Columbia University and so on. Another uh, um, voice that came out at that time was Jeremy Rifkin and uh, the empathic civilization very very powerful uh, uh, you know 15 minutes I must have watched this a dozen couple of dozen times but what he's really saying is that there is an empathic gene embedded in us you know that um, that that has us experience what the other person experiences huh? um, and what he is arguing in this in this uh, you know 15 minute video there and in his book you know that summarizes his book really is that um, we have the capacity to to bring out empathy uh, and in our empathic sense um, but we we have to work it, you know? and the uh, and I think we you know talked a little bit in the thread about fear, how fear disrupts the ability for this em empathy to to really function. I think you have to have a sense of peace first, you know, and a sense of uh, inner uh, 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 stability and 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 and, and harmony before. You know you're able to to experience that but this is um i mean another truly um thoughtful way to to find you know a, a connection with with the general public that needs to that needs to begin to understand I and mean, it needs to really come into an understanding of what we're doing with nature and why this is you know, so destructive and so dangerous at this time. Um, plus, um, I, I don't think this is an exaggeration, but nonviolent social action seems to me to be designed to evoke empathy in others. Uh, the, the principles and dynamics of nonviolent social action are to accept violence and to accept hatred from other people but I think rely heavily on that being seen by others through media. Like you want the reporters there, you want cameras on it so that it's not just local witnesses, but rather the world that winds up seeing that you're being mistreated in a public way and in a horrible way and that that's not right. Uh, and it's caused a tremendous amount of change in the world uh, for the good. It hasn't solved the problems, but really works. And so it feels like triggering that empathic response is, is a important and functional tool. And one of my concerns now is that when the enemy knows that that's what you're doing, they can disrupt that as well. And that's happening actively now. Yes. So, and, and, and that add that to the fact that humans are so adaptable that we get inured to violence and to images like this. And our, 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 we start to just, they're either overwhelming or they're boring by repetition or who knows what, but they lose their their effectiveness that way. And that scares me a lot because that human empathic response is really, really important. And in a generation raised with first person shooters and God knows what else, I don't know what's going on there. I worry about that a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Judy and Ken. I guess part of what I'm thinking about here is that when we think about the massiveness of all things, if we were to be able hum humanly to minimize humanity and think in terms of all of the other dynamic living forces that would connect us more fundamentally to questions 
of the type we're discussing. But I also think that our society, our human-centric society, has minimized the effect or impact of empathy and the ability to connect to other people. It's so isolationist in many of its teachings and tenets that there's no systematic process other than the parental environment to encourage children and young people and other citizens to contemplate the inherent empathy that they've lost touch with. And I don't know how to address that because it's, it's, it's sort of a, almost a mysticism concept for many people in Western civilizations. Um, but the fact that we've lost touch with the smallness of human, humans in the scope of the entire ecosystem of the world and the planets and everything else is disturbing to me, but I don't know how to address it. A couple, a couple of years ago, my heart broke a little bit when I read an article about how they were trying to teach like second graders empathy by bringing babies into the classroom. And I was like, oh God, like, have, like we were really broken if this is what we're doing. I'm glad they're trying something, but, but, you know, we're born with this. Well, I just remember an admonition that I got that set me back when I was younger. My mom thought I was too trusting. And so she thought that I shouldn't trust people unless they had demonstrated that they were trustworthy. Um, and that stuck for a while. And then I realized the inverse was what I needed to do that I wanna trust everyone until I have evidence that they're not trustworthy. <laughs> and if they're not trustworthy, then I can change my evaluation. Um, and that was something I did 30 years ago or so, but that early childhood training was unhelpful. <laughs> and you just described beautifully those, the two approaches to it, like is your default setting to mistrust everyone until they prove that they're trustworthy or opposite. And I, I agree with your read on that completely. Mr. Homer, whenever you feel like. Some of you may know Stephen Mitchell. Um, Stephen used to live here in Marin. I'd see him pretty regularly on the trails and at Spirit Rock. And uh, he spent many years as a student of Zen um, with a Zen master in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and he decided to, he's a very brilliant man, uh, author, translator, uh, reads and writes many different languages, Greek, Latin, uh, Aramaic. And he thought, I really want to explore um, the life and teachings of Jesus. He wrote a book called The Gospel According to Jesus. And he went back to the original Aramaic texts that he could find. And he said, there's two things that Jesus said more than anything else. And the first one was fear not. And he said, you know, having been trained in a spiritual discipline, I, I was looking for authentic spiritual teachings because in my experience, um, a, a teacher does not proscribe behavior, uh, but rather gives you useful uh, information about how to behave, not how not to behave. And a lot of the uh, information in the Bible um, is not authentic from a spiritual teaching standpoint, but rather from the early church fathers who were trying to control people. And uh, Thomas Jefferson had what he called the Jefferson Bible. Uh, and he would copy out parts of the Bible that he thought were authentic. And he said, it's as easy as picking diamonds from a dunghill to check, to pull out the, the real nuggets of wisdom there. And so... I love this idea that that Jesus said, you know, fear not. That was his main teaching was do not be afraid. Because the minute you become afraid, you contract, you lose connection. You, you lose connection to resources, both internally and externally. And you start to see threats. And um, it puts you in a place where you become reactive rather than reflective. Uh, and it, it leads to the, the male side of the amygdala of the fight, flight, freeze, as opposed to the female side of the amygdala, which is tend and befriend. And the other thing that Jesus said um, among all of his teachings more often than anything else was love thy neighbor as thyself, which is an amazing systems teaching. Because if you love your neighbor as yourself, then before you rea react to your neighbor in a poor way, you say, well, how is this something that's reflective of me? You know, And if I've got something going on with my neighbor that is challenging to me, 
how do I relate to that within myself? Do I project that out on them or do I examine where's that coming from? So to me, this is really um, uh, so useful, you know, to, to know these things. Now, I'm not a theist. I, I, you know, that's not my, my path, but I find this, perspective into the teachings of Jesus, which is, you know, he's had a profound influence on a lot of people. Um, but I don't think a lot of people recognize this. I, they, they, they have not delved deeply in to see what did the man actually say more than anything else. The other story I wanted to tell was about Saban Fusume, Maladoma's wife. Um, I, I did workshops with both of them 30 years ago when they were out here in the Bay Area. And Saban Fu was telling a story of <clears throat> Um, was Jefferson's, sorry, was Jefferson's work an influence on Mitchell? Yeah, it was part of his research. He, he read the, the Jefferson Bible. Um, you can check out the book and it's there. Uh, but Sabanfu was telling a story of um, being in Burkina Faso, and they, which is where, where she's from. Uh, and they brought a group of women from Germany. And these women were just talking and talking and talking. They were not paying attention to anything. And she took them down to the river and had them lay down next to the river and covered them in mud. It's just be quiet. Just stop talking. Just be quiet and feel yourself on the earth and listen to the river. And it was transformative. After that, they began to notice things. They began to become much more aware of the world around them. And this is another really powerful teaching for me of if you take some time to connect with the earth, the earth will tell you things, but you have to be open. You have to be willing to let go of all of your uh, weird Western educated, rich industrial democratic mindset and open yourself. I read a story of, from a, a man who takes some um, troubled youth on, on wilderness retreats up in Alaska. And he said, it takes them about, you know, first they freak out because we take away their phones and all their, their games and stuff. And the first three or four days, they're totally, they don't know what to do. They're having all kinds of anxiety. He said, and after about 72 to 96 hours, their eyes begin to resolve the world in a new way. They start to see patterns in nature. They start to wake up. Nature is there. It's alive. There's an African saying, the whole world's alive and talking to you, you know, and you, you begin to come into a different way of being, a different set of relationships. And uh, I think that's that's another piece that those of us who live in cities or, or even those who live in the country but don't spend time really connecting with nature, we could all learn something from. Just take some time every day, get outside. I have a friend who, as long as it's not raining, she goes out year round and lays on the ground for half an hour every day. So this is my this is how I, I stay rooted and connected. Um, so a couple of things that were just thrown through my mind as a result of this conversation. Thanks, Ken. I think it's a nice moment for a pause. So let's just go into silence for a bit. Um, I'll bring us back out and then we can see where we go for our last little stretch here. It occurs to me that maybe when summer is back, we can have a call where everybody is lying on the ground. And our job is to call in with our phones and we'll have a call. We'll have an OGM call. I think that'd be lovely. Right now, not so good in Portland. Yeah, you've had flooding up there. Are you okay? Is everything... Uh, everything's fine. There were flood warnings, but it's just been raining a whole bunch. I think in another three days, it'll clear up for a bit, but there is no drought here. The aquifer is being replenished nicely on this little corner of Oakland, of Oregon. I think there's, there's other parts that are 
uh, more toward drought. But thank you. Um, I, I ran an experiment with some friends one day in New Mexico of laying on the ground and grounding into the sky. Very interesting um, practice. Fire ants, come on, Bill, you know, just tough it out, man. I would tough it out, but I have a very severe reaction in the parts of my body that get bitten swell up enormously. So, no. <laughs> but I will say, <laughs> um, but I will say that um, since I was a lo little child, I've always been interested in clouds. For some reason, I thought I was going to be a meteorologist, but whatever. Um, <laughs> but so I'm, you know, it's like the most uh, cheapest entertainment around. It you just look up into the sky, <laughs> and if there are clouds there, it's you know. It's actually quite, uh, it's a lot, of, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> it's nice at and a night, A lot of too. fun. Pardon? It's nice at night, too. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Hank, then John, who's probably walking back with his groceries. Uh, thanks again, everybody. I just have a quick question, uh, if anyone can steer me to some uh, resources about it. Next week, I'll be with a group of 16 uh, uh, government officials from different countries. Uh, we're doing what we're calling a wilderness camp in the middle of Finland, uh, near the Russian border, where there are mostly only trees, as far as I've been told, and of course, there are some cabins for people. And I would like to uh, introduce them to some resources about the, the immaterial value of the wilderness, the value of the wilderness that cannot be put into uh, commodification by society. Anyone has any sources of people who written or spoken about that, uh, I really appreciate it in the chat. Thanks. Thanks, Hank. Um, I think uh, there's a couple of books out, like The Mother Tree and things about the Wood Wide Web that are, might be interesting, that are probably better known. Uh, and also April just went uh, to a, a week-long happiness masterclass, and she taught a piece of it in Finland. Uh, which was really, really interesting. And it was held at a resort uh, out in the woods someplace. I'll, uh, I'll get the name of it uh, just in case it's the place you're going. Uh, John, floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so a short tribute and warning and, and advice and plus warning about uh, Norman Lear. First a tribute, amazing, amazing gift to humanity. Uh, lots of things you could say. Uh, there's a lesson and a warning in Archie Bunker or in all of the family. Um, the lesson for all of us is, uh, in relation to this talk is, you know, that we're, I would say that we're a, a sort of a flexibly woke group. We're not rigidly woke, but we're woke, you know, let's, in the sense that we, we have a rich set of, uh, references that we can accurately assume we share with the other people and therefore we may not be as accommodating of the let's say the Archie Bunker position uh, so the, the lesson is you know if we were going to do a scenario that involved training uh, or, or offering training for folks along a continuum uh, that might wind up where we hope it would wind up it might need to begin with uh, you know let's stick to cute hand of bears or you know in other words in other words the idea of quote unquote dumbing down the i the the bigger picture the, the connectedness th there's a way to do it that's respectful that's that's not dumbing down but does take into account the fact that 
there are going to be people who are going to come in at the panda level. That's I'm just you get what I mean. You know, they're going to, they're drawn into the cuteness, uh, and that's okay. You know, you want what you want to do is you want to have an entry ramp that's there, and then you want to ease people along as 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 well as they can. And given the scarcity of resources, I the horse thing is amazing. I. I I don't have direct experience of this, but I have a lot of indirect experience. People in my family who've done the horse trainings, and uh, yeah, you want to you want to maybe save that for at least for now when it's pretty hard to do and pretty expensive. You want to save it for maybe some of the uh, young people who are having a much greater difficulty uh, adapting to their to their situations. Um, so those are just two notes. Oh, and the, the warning of, from, from Archie Bunker is they did some surveys. Uh, Carol Connor, the, the actor who played him, you know, gave an interview late in life and said, you know, he, they had, he'd done some, they'd done some interviews with people and he was worried about the fact that the Archie character was for some people reinforcing rather than questioning, uh, that point of view. And and they wanted they basically said yeah Archie's right and I'm like Archie and you know that's how things should be and and meathead really is a meathead and um, so you know we have to we have to be a little uh, careful when we design that that continuum um, of experiences that it it goes from the perhaps the, the simplified perhaps the cute or the sweet and then it eases into uh, you know getting in the mud <laughs> or, or doing whatever else uh some what, what many of us have done you know in our in our experiences okay so that's it um john thank you and thanks for sharing your bus ride with us that's awesome uh okay. or are you you're not on the bus you're on a at a bus shelter or where? no i'm actually i'm at a uh you know the, i'm at a post covid restaurant or a covid restaurant in other words it's the outdoors of a closed restaurant where, there we you know, go. All these things instead of parking, parking meters. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, it's an amazing hallmark of our, of the our culture and the time that we've been through. And I hope we keep them. I hope, I hope they don't all get taken down. Because I think they're, they're very interesting in terms of how they disrupted uh, our notion of public space. I was sad to see a lot of the parklet stuff go away when people thought the pandemic was all that gone and yeah. done. With. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're going to keep we're going to keep them here. Uh, too many too many restaurants made too much money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or survive because they have so they're going to fight. They're going to fight to keep them. Exactly. Um, part of what you were saying was was about the the journey or the path that I'm really really interested in, which is how do you and how does one engage people who might not be open to some of these messages or thoughts in a way that works for them? It's a bit of what Hank was saying too. Uh, and, and then, and then what is the journey from that point? Like, and, and how do we meet someplace in the middle? And one of the things I think I admired a lot about Archie Bunker and all in the family was how it dealt with social issues really pretty bluntly, but in a very humorous way. Um, and it, it, you know, I miss shows like that. And I've, you've heard me say, some of you've heard me say before that I hated the, the comedy of the nineties because it was Seinfeld and, and friends. And the show about nothing and a show where I couldn't tell who was sleeping with whom and I didn't care. Um, and, and and it was just so opposite and different from uh, Norman Lear and and other other attempts to sort of address some of these issues, dangers notwithstanding. Um, anyone else with closing thoughts for today's call about sort of re reflecting on on the topic uh, and ways that you would like to revisit it or extend it or anything like that. Um, I'll go. Um, thank you. Thank you all for a lovely call. Um, uh, it's been really thought provoking and interesting for me. Um, I want to acknowledge that um, I started in anger. Um, uh, I'm angry at humans. Um, I hear um, Brother Ken's um, uh, conveyed wisdom uh, not to walk in fear, uh, and so walking in anger is is you know uh, akin to that. Um, I also hear Brother Ken's uh, exhortation 
to remember that um, that it's not all humans um, that are terrible. Um, and I still have problems with that one because for me, it's kind of a tend your own house thing. Uh, you know, if there's a human torturing some non-human thing, any human and all humans should go over and say, hey, like, we don't do that kind of thing. We're not that kind of uh, species. And, and so um, I know I don't do that in my life. I don't go over to people and say, hey, you know, that concentrated animal feeding operation, let's not do that because I think we ought to be better than that. I don't do that. Uh, so I'm guilty too. Um, but I live in a society where I'm pretty sure that would not be as, uh, you know, not, not have, um, have the impact that I would want it to have. So, um, so I can ignore my anger, I guess, uh, but I can't let go of it. Thank you for those reflections. Really appreciate them. Makes great sense. Um, Klaus Carl that I'm hoping Ken has a poem to take us out. Yeah, I'm I'm just reflecting how um, how to structure communications to to reach that um, empathic nerve, you know. Um, and actually, you know, as we're talking, what what is sort of becoming uh, to the front is that. Um, 10 years ago, there were a lot of voices talking about what we're doing to nature and how dangerous that is. So I'm talking about the Laudato Si and Jeremy Riffin came out with this. Prince Charles, Charles at the time Prince, gave a speech at Georgetown University that was amazing, you know, talking about uh, uh, how we are how we have created a completely unsustainable food system that will that will you know, run out. Um, but then these voices have fallen silent. You know? So the last few years, um, the rancor has increased. Um, there is uh, uh, you know, an adamant rejection of the kind of changes that would be required to, to uh, reconnect ourselves you know, with the natural world and to pay attention to uh, the the issues that we have created in nature, and so and and now uh, I mean very deliberately so, and that's really scary. Um, uh, you know, I mean you 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 mentioned uh, Jerry that you know the, the peaceful protests um, uh, you know are a a powerful tool if there's a camera on it and people can see it. But also that has been sort of successfully uh, you know, taken out because the media is you know, all captured. So we are in a really precarious time, and to figure out how to how to uh, structure mind pictures you know, in ways that they resonate, um, I think that's really that's really a task. Yeah. The task of our time, sort of. Um, Carl. Then we'll sneak Stacy in and then Ken. Well, Klaus's comment there reminded me of I saw something Peter Senge talked about our the Amer the US food supply travels 2,000 miles per pound. And and then um, also um, the Institute for the Future, they were talking about when we talk about planetary energy, I mean it's like like millions of barrels of oil kind of thing. So they came up with cubic miles of oil and we get four, about 42 cubic miles of oil worth of energy from the sun every day. So just that idea of units of measure can kind of get, maybe can spark people to think in a different way. And then the last thing was, I posted a link to um, Brother David, Steindel Ross there, but um, the grandfather of gratitude, but maybe I listened to quite a few things over the over Thanksgiving weekend. So maybe we, if we can get more people watching that, just feel gratitude for things. And that kind of the theme for, for what we've been talking about today. 
And thank you for those things. Yeah. I just wanted to throw something out real quickly to be talked about maybe another time. In all of my life experience, what I found is that the most success in connecting has always been through grief. And I think that that is um, a place that we should look to. Like if, when we're trying to come up with how do we do this, there's something in connecting through grief. And it's a much longer discussion. Um, and the lovely opening. Um, thank you for that, Stacey. And that reminds me of a story that I heard Jack Cornfield tell 30 some odd years ago of after the Vietnam War, quote, ended when the Americans pulled out, um, there was a, a very famous Buddhist monk who gathered all these people together in uh, Vietnam. And these were folks who'd been on both sides and there were wounded people and people who'd suffered tremendous loss of family and property and homes. And, and you know, there's a lot of tension in the atmosphere. And we really want to know what is this man going to say? How is he going to help, you know, all these people who are suffering? And he came out and he just chanted, Hatred never ceases from hatred, but by love alone is healed. This is an ancient and eternal law. And he just kept repeating that. And slowly, one by one, people just began to weep at all of the loss that they'd had and recognizing that the anger and the hatred was not going to help. And it dissolved something very hard in that field and allowed a different um, way of being to come forth. And I think that's always worth remembering that uh, I have to remind myself often of... Um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of anger in my life and a lot of, uh, I've had a lot of hatred in my life and, and really been working hard these last 30 years to soften that and, and cleanse that out of my system. And part of that showed up in the story with my father of, you know, um, if anybody who read my, my post in Plex, who, I was really pissed at him for a very long time. Um, but I, I had to come around and, and look through his eyes and see what was going on. Um, and that helped me to let go a lot of my, my anger so before um, po before yeah. poetry can thank you for that post and pete thank you for creating a vessel for that post that was really special to read it's the first time i've shared that the only other person who's seen that is my wife um i wrote it you know 13 years ago now but um i came across it this week i'm like you know i, I want to and, and in honor of the call of you know i want to honor my dad here so Appreciate. Uh, I've had a couple people email me directly and say it was moving to them. I really appreciate that. So thank you if you if it, it reached you in any way. Okay, uh, home. How about we go to D. H. Lawrence? <laughs> Escape. When we get out of the glass bottles of our ego, and we escape like squirrels turning in the cages of our personality, and we get into the forests again. We shall shiver with cold and fright, but things will happen to us so that we don't know ourselves. Cool, unlying life will rush in, and passion will make our bodies taut with power. We shall stamp our feet with new power, and old things will fall down. We shall laugh, and institutions will curl up like burnt paper. From your lips Escape. to God's ears. That's a really lovely way to end this call. Thank you. Thank you all. It's been awesome. Yeah, I'll 